So I was going to ask, obviously, um, both of you have been carers yourself, um, been in that industry. Um, I was really interested that the film takes a, it takes a really original approach to investigating this as a subject. And I wanted to know what your aims and objectives were whilst you were producing the film and how you went about achieving them. I can maybe start try to start again, and then you you um, you add on to that. Um, like you said, Leah, uh, we got this material, or we were provided this material from the from the film museum, um, because they collect they collect footage from amateur filmmakers, and then sometimes make it make it um, accessible either by showing it in its original form or by um, uh, letting artists uh, deal with it. And both of us, in the first in in the first step, started to approach the material on our own. And then at some point we realized that our interests were very similar because both of us were looking for depictions of work in this material. Um, what we, I think we haven't said is that most of the films are from the 60s and 70s. So we were very much interested in how um, work is made visible and it's very and I think um, and how how labor is being made visible and there's basically two strands of, of videos. One is the home movies that Leah mentioned and one is um, filmed from vacations. And I think that also uh, made it very interesting that when, when uh, the only times where paid uh, labor was being shown was when workers in other countries were being uh, filmed through this through this gaze of this home video camera. But then, of course, there's a, a lot of um, unpaid uh, domestic work being shown or not being shown. And then I think that's the that's the interesting point, or that's where we came together and said, okay, we need to we want to join forces on this and try to try to figure out what does this new this position of women holding the camera now and uh, filming home life, if not home work, maybe. Um, how, how does this make uh, so-called invisible work or reproductive labor more visible or not? And there were many uh, contradictions uh, we found in that and we tried to, we tried to uh, talk to with each other, which became difficult to talking to each other, but that's maybe where I hand it over to you, Leah. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, during the pandemic, when we couldn't meet because, um, yeah, we were all working in our own flats, we started with the Google Docs and sharing our thoughts and and also a lot of text material, and it was uh, from time to time it was a bit like a like a day book. Do you say that day book? Like like we 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 wrote our thoughts and and um, yeah, and with a focus on um, on the. Or, yeah, with a strong focus on care work, actually, how the care work for us changed, how it is affected for us. And we were both in different situations where we're doing um, care work I, I, in paid ways. I did it in paid um, for like a job and Simon in private context. And so we were also talking also about that. And then we started to send each, each other voice messages. Um, and I think and, and then we started to use them as voiceover. So I'm actually, I'm at the moment, I'm not sure if, we, if there's still original uh, footage from the, uh, from the voice mess messages in the, in the, in the, it is right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I mean, we, then we talked also with the, with the microphone and when we could meet again, because we worked very long on the film and then uh, also with pause and for months we did nothing and then we start again and then the film got really huge like it was 40 minutes at some point and then we reduced it to six minutes and then we we, we extended it again to the size it is right now so it was really a very ongoing process and yeah well, that's really interesting i love that you used the voice notes in the actual film i think that's really that's a really interesting aspect um, I was going to say, I really liked that you highlighted, as you say, you've worked in the care industry before, so both of you have experience in it. I liked that you kind of highlighted some of the rewarding aspects of it. Um, I think there's there's a general notion that you don't really get to see or hear about. Um, and I thought it was really interesting that you did that through ar archival footage. I think you've already kind of answered this question, but I was going to say, how did you go about finding this footage? And what were your choices with the footage that you actually picked? Um, 
hard to say actually. I mean, because there's also um, there's also still vacation material in the movie. So um, like winter sports because we it's all footage from from Austria. Austria so um, skiing, for instance, is a is a strong topic and it appears in different materials uh, from different filmmakers. And um, at some point we, we, we used it because um, it's, uh, we, we got thoughts, thoughts about it. But also, hmm, hmm, what were the other aspects? I don't know, we, we went through the material and we were like, it, it wasn't really a strong concept. So, I, I, right? Or did we have one? I don't know. No, I don't think so. Strong concept, but I think it, it really grew on us because we really spent a lot of time working with it and rewatching it and rewatching it, and then somehow, of course, building also an emotional uh, attachment to these materials. And I think what maybe it wasn't a concept, but it was a decision at some point to work with the material and not against the material, which would have been easy probably. It would have been easy to to critique it or to criticize it for for notions, especially the gaze on vacation, or then how different family constellations are portrayed or how, how, of course, extremely heteronormative and domestic everything is. And it would have been easy to, to have a voice over and criticize it. But we decided not to do this because these films weren't meant to be published and it would somehow be a weird gesture to say, okay, now here we are and now we're, we're criticizing it, but rather thinking of how can we uh, think through uh, the material and with the material and how to, I think you, you called it a like a the rewarding perspective and i think we we were also also in terms of the material trying to focus on um what what does it show us or how 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 can we think how can how do these these videos and these clips enhance some kind of thinking about what is shown and what is not shown um yeah yeah definitely i i really agree i thought it was really interesting that the, the footage, you could tell that you kind of had a relationship with these people that you didn't know, if that makes sense in a way. And you could see that you like it was very sentimental, which I really enjoyed. So we've just been joined by Anas, um, the director of Santa Splash, um, the trombone that saved me. So if you just want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your film, if that's okay. Okay, hi. Uh, first of all, uh, sorry for joining late uh, because today is the first day for Ramadan and we were preparing the food. Um, I'm Anas uh, Sarahaddin, the director of the short documentary Zalpa Splash or uh, Trombone That Saved Me. I have studied screenwriting at Higher Institute of Cinema in Egypt. Uh, then I moved to Germany to work as a video producer in um, Offner Canal Magdeburg. Uh, and there I was responsible for uh, recording uh, and filming interviews, uh, concerts, and uh, documentaries. Uh, and before the first wave of Corona, I met uh, Stefan, uh, the main character in the film Zamta Splash. Uh, he was a former orchestra leader and music teacher who worked for more than 25 years in this field. Then because of health issues, he got uh, retired. Uh, then he started to work as a street musician. I met him in the first time uh, in the way of, of my work in front of the main station in Magdeburg. Uh, then I started to talk with him. I liked uh, the music that he's playing. Uh, and we started to film. Then the COVID comes uh, and we continued uh, filming uh, during the first wave uh, of Corona. Uh, and that, uh, what is the film about? It's like um, a self-portrait uh, about him. And the music is just his life. Uh, since he retired, he spent almost two years uh, without uh, playing music, and he was really sad and he got uh, he got depressed. Then, and, uh, once in a while, he started to play music in, in the street. Uh, he really liked it, and uh, it becomes his main job now. Yeah, it's a it's a lovely film, and I was really touched mm. by his story. I was. I feel like you've answered this question already, but I wanted to know why you chose to focus on this topic and how you came about yeah. Stephen. But obviously, as you said, you came across him through work. But I thought it was interesting that you chose him as a subject. Uh, yeah, for me, I really like street musicians and um, I was focusing on them. And every time when I see a street musician, I talk with him and, uh, and know the stories. In the beginning, honestly, I wanted to make about another 
a musician in Magdeburg and then uh, he came he was Romanian and he came to Germany eight years ago and he became really famous and he made concerts all over Germany and all over Europe uh, but he's still playing music in the street uh, every day but he was not interested at all in filming I tried by several ways and I asked them my plays and they know him they told me he will not do it and uh, then when I met Stefan, I really liked him uh, more and I felt that I'm lucky that I didn't film with, with the first guy. Yeah, you can definitely sense that you have a, a close relationship in the film, which I really like. Mm -hmm. He seems really open with you, which is really interesting. In the beginning, he wasn't at all. <laughs> Uh, like in, in the first uh, week, I remember the first two weeks, uh, he was acting. Like when I just put the camera, he was really acting and he was not as natural as he was in the film. Then uh, I, I didn't record, I just went to him and tried to be friend with him, uh, to go outside, uh, to have a dinner together, uh, to ask about him, how is his life uh, going and to get uh, to know him more and also to share more personal info with him about me. Then we started that, I started, I felt that he's ready and, uh, and and the problem also, my German was not that good and he's not speaking so good English. So we were communicating uh, a bit by mixed German and English. Uh, and I got the idea that he's a music teacher and I'm interested in music too. So I asked him if he could teach me piano and I recorded this. But I didn't put it in the film. But this, this, uh, this was the first natural scene which was recorded in the film. After that, he, he felt okay with the camera. Then we we started uh, to film it again. Oh, right, I see. I was actually this was one of my questions that I was going to ask you. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, learning piano, I was going to mm -hmm. ask whether that altered your filmmaking process. Um, did it influence you at all, and did it change the way that you? the film looked in the end? Uh, in the beginning, as I told you, uh, uh, when I met him uh, in, in the street, uh, the first uh, impression that I got about him, that he's really typical German who doesn't speak a word of English, or even if he speaks, he will tell me, sorry, I don't speak uh, English, but he was not that at all. Uh, so he was speaking a bit English, uh, and uh, we recorded an, an interview with him in English. And uh, when I watched this interview, he, it wasn't comfortable for him at all. And uh, for every personal thing, he was just shifting to speak in German, and they didn't get it well. But then I said, okay, uh, if I didn't even understand it now, I could un understood it later, and uh, at least I understood what he's talking about. Uh, so I told him, okay, we, we will uh, speak uh, in German, it's your comfortable language, and uh, for you it would be much better, and they will learn also from you. So we started filming again uh, in German, and uh, as I told you, the first two weeks of uh, wasn't really shooting, was just to get uh, to know him. And then later, yeah, I, uh, I used to go to his home like almost three or four times a week. Uh, he's living in a small village called the Durban and Sachsen Anhalt in Germany, and he was living in Magdeburg. It's like one hour by car. Uh, and he uh, moves or, or he could travel to area to a different city uh, like three or four times a week. So I was m meeting him there, or sometimes I can go to Durban, then we go together to the country that uh, or the city that uh, he will play. Uh, we shoot for almost uh, four months from uh, end of uh, February till end of, uh, of June uh, 2020. Uh, the shooting takes um, around 25 uh, days. Uh, and yeah, that, that was it. Yeah, um, I'm going to pass over to Simon and Leah here in terms of um, the process of filmmaking. So I thought it was interesting as well that you, I think you mentioned this in the film, you say that archival footage is often seen as being like this nostalgic and idyllic thing and it's, mm. it's kind of nice and you think of it like that, but you used it as a way to reveal the care and the labour that goes into care work. Um, I just wanted to know how you went around about, sorry, how you went about this in terms of editing and how the film kind of came together in terms of that. 
I think like we said, I'll, I'll, I'll try to have a first go. I think um, yeah, we tried to we tried to understand what kind of um, thoughts can be distilled from the material, and especially in terms of editing yeah, and how to how to communicate through the material. I think there were those two aspects. On the one hand, was what does the material tell us basically, and how can then we communicate with it? Because then at some point that we accompanied the voice messages we sent each other with um, material that we already edited very sloppishly sometimes because it was sure it, we, we just did it for each other and uh, sent it to each other. But then it already started telling uh, small stories or probably jokes or something. And then uh, we grew attached to some of the cuts and some of the edits. And I think that's that's what we then took along. And then we spent a lot of time um, when it was possible again, uh, we spent a lot of time sitting together and going through it together and editing it and trying to and then trying to give it a kind of um, rhythm. And also, I think we played a lot in, in the meantime, and that's probably was part of the 40 minute version that you mentioned, Leo, um, with different with with trying to uh, also uh, uh, portray it differently or put one uh, film still into into another or uh, play with the sizes of it. But then we returned to the original material because we thought, no, um, what's interesting is to make it make an essay out of it and not to aesthetically uh, uh, make it make it a completely new form, I think. Yeah, definitely. I, I really liked that you kind of um, turned it into an academic argument almost, but it didn't feel like, to me, it didn't feel like someone lecturing me. It felt like two people kind of explaining something that I didn't know a lot about, and I thought it was really interesting that you kind of managed to do that in your film. Yeah, what's interesting is to make, make an essay out of it. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we, we uh, actually, we used also a bit or, or for us during the I mean, during the working on the film, we also used um, like quotes from 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 literature or, or from science sci um, science stuff or, um, about care work mostly. Um, but the the real quotes we uh, in the in the end nothing nothing last. <laughs> yeah, because we really tried to give it a personal approach um, and. I mean that's I I think a um, um, kind of a way doing art with both have it in in, in our um, different ways that we try to really um, have a personal approach with the with science and and theory and 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 thinking how to yeah communicate communicate science stuff or, or theory stuff but not in a way that we're lecturing people but in a way that is also interesting and and um, and sometimes funny and also new for us always. Yeah, yeah I definitely I, um, I struggle a lot with theory sometimes, especially like labor processes. And I just thought your documentary really explained it very well, and it was very concise. So I really enjoyed it in that way. Um, I just want to ask and ask. Um, so like we were saying before about the adding like your own personal experience in it how did you did you find a way to do this yourself obviously you had a relationship with Stephen um how did you go about that and did you run into any difficulties because you had such a close relationship uh yeah for me uh, to make a German film or to make a film about another culture for me of course it was a challenge uh, because the first thing it was not so confident from the language and I didn't speak it really well even if I understood it well but I, I, I just lived there before for shooting this film I just lived there for less than one year so I was afraid uh, that um, if someone watched the film will see will or will say uh, this film is, is not really or not German or not about this character so what I did I was I really, me and Stefan became really, really good uh, friends. Uh, we shared a lot of things, and as I told you, uh, starting by him, he touched uh, me music. Uh, I was telling him so much uh, personal things. Then later, I felt so comfortable in his home, and I felt this home is like is a bit similar to my grandpa uh, house in his village. Uh, I felt that this village is similar to my village in, in Egypt. 
so I felt there are a lot of, of similarities between uh, me and him. Uh, then when, when I started to do this film about him, I didn't feel afraid or I didn't feel that I, I don't know him. No, I feel that I really know him uh, so well. Uh, and he was so open and he made it much, much easier. He shared a lot of things. Even he shared many things that we didn't put on the film, like we recorded for almost 80 hours and the film was uh, 20 minutes and a half. So he really shared um, a lot of things. Uh, he was so open and he made it much easier uh, for us. Uh, and yeah, when I was watching uh, the material, I was watching the material day by day and um, some things were not uh, um, perfect or we need to film it again. Uh, when I when I see, uh, when um, I let him watch the material, uh, it makes him more excited when he when he saw himself in, in the screen, and uh, he understood how to be natural. Uh, so that that, that was almost uh, the way how how we did it. Um, so we just had a question from YouTube from Ruth. Mm -hmm. Um, mm. And she asks, how is Stefan and how did he survive the pandemic without being able to perform as a musician? Uh, in, in the beginning, in, like in the first two weeks of, of uh, the pandemic, um, the Germans was going on the street uh, regularly and no one would say anything and uh, almost uh, really few people were wearing masks and they just went outside like as as they took a vacation for one or ten days so people were going on, on the street and actually there was one scene in the film it was filmed in the first week of, of corona but in the film uh, we said that this is before corona because really there was no difference at all the whole family were going and uh, it was okay and in the first wave, it was not long, it was almost uh, three months, as I, as I remember. And then Stephen went to play, uh, like for example, for, for the old people and, and the house that they are staying in, uh, without money for free. Uh, he used to go, then uh, Stephen also was a bit afraid because he had ill health issues. Uh, he was afraid a bit uh, to get uh, infected by the virus, uh, but then later, he, when he stayed in his house, I felt that it, it's not comfortable for him, his place on the street to play music, even if he, uh, if he, if he will stay for, for a longer time, if frequently he used to play for two hours, he will just play for 30 minutes. And the people, uh, some people said to him, uh, it's better for you to go to your home, it's pandemic, uh, you shouldn't play. But other people were happy, uh, were supporting him by giving him money. Uh, we also did uh, a live concert for him uh, and we put his PayPal account so people can donate or can uh, put uh, or give him money if they liked his music. Uh, but then later, starting from uh, June, uh, it works really fine with him again as, as before. Yeah, I think that leads us on really nicely to my next question for Simon and Leah. So I wanted to ask you about the impact of the pandemic on the care industry. Obviously, you talk about it a lot in your film. Um, and I wanted to see, I think, did you, you started the film during the pandemic, um, obviously. I wanted to see what kind of reaction you got from your film um, and whether this, how people perceived it and whether people were more kind of um, open to hearing about these things because of the pandemic. Um, I think it's a, it's a tough one because of course everyone's very open to talk about it, but it's not, it's not uh, having become any better in any way, um, not financially at least, and especially not in this, yeah, I think especially not uh, in terms of how, how caring relationships and families are being um, seen and being dealt with with the government. And at the moment, they're just um, don't care about it. Like they're, they're uh, especially now with people having to care for others, there is no regulations anymore. I think 
probably I'm just especially angry because we had this very good test system in, in, in Vienna where you get, could get tested for free and now they knocked it because we have a right-wing government and they knocked it down um, in order to, not in order to, but basically making vulnerable people that were always the focus of the pandemic are saying we have to we have to care about each other and we have to care about the most vulnerable and now they're um now this is all it's all being it's all being um not taken any care of anymore for the logics of profit but probably that that evades the question a bit nothing clear you can answer it more specifically probably with that um yeah i think that um different aspects yeah drept um what i, I did during the when we were working at the film uh, on the film, I also did a research on um, care work in, in a bit of, uh, a, a bit bigger picture or a bit more in general, and um, for a theater play, and um, yeah, and there I um, uh, um, meet uh, um, and how, how can you say it? It's not a it's a, it's not a verein. See Simon, how would you would you would you, would you call it? It's like a it's a kind of collectivization, but it's not a union or something. It's not a union, but it was in the in the beginning. It was a um, Facebook group where um, where twenty four hour workers from Romania, because it was a Romanian um, group, a Romanian fa speaking Facebook group, and uh, twenty four hour hour workers in domestic. Oh, I think we are might have lost you frozen there. <laughs> yeah, and the signal is not working. But... Um, that's fine. So, Simon, um, do you want to continue? Oh, sorry, Leo's back. back. Oh, I'm back. Oh, I sorry, froze for a second. Ah, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, is it fine working? Yeah, it's working. Um, it's still working, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, but but it was very interesting. I, I met this this group um, when they're demonstrating on the eighth um, eight of um, uh, March, on the uh, uh, women's um, uh, fighting women's day, and they were demonstrating. And this is it's very. And we also thought um, also for the film, but also in general about how it's possible to go on strike for work uh, for worker in the care industry, or in domestic context, and also for. Um, unpaid uh, people doing unpaid labor because all of them are necessarily have to be at home because they're caring for people who who need them all the time so they can't go go out and especially for workers from uh, f from different country and countries which are not speaking the language and also doing a lift in job like they're living with the people they're caring for that was a very difficult situation and and it comes to light in Austria because they during the pandemic, they um, they they hired special trains to get them into the country because they are not so necessary for the yeah for the care com complete care um, uh, care working system in, in in Austria and yeah and they they said that a lot uh, a lot will be done and it's not really happening so far so we will we will see how it turns out but it was very disappointing because we I was at least thinking in the beginning of the pandemic that maybe now that it's so in the focus of the media and a lot of people yeah have uh, talk about it that that it's that it will change the the conditions but i am so far it's really it's difficult mm -hmm. yeah, i think your documentary definitely makes the case for why things should change and the care work industry should have a lot more money basically and i think that's a really important part of it um sorry and and also I think what's also important is that that uh, there's a bit of a down spiral because the because it's always said in the media that the that the conditions are so difficult and they are so that there are not enough people doing the jobs and it's not enough paid and all of that, but that leads leads more that nobody wants to do it anymore. So so who can a lot of people um leave the leave this uh this, this work so and, and that makes it much more difficult so it's really yeah it's 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 also about how how it's talked about in the media i mean the whole care care work in general should become more um the value should be more expressed or seen or shown 
Yeah, and I think that's such an important point because there, this question of visibility and invisibility has like a completely different dimension because it's become very visible, and uh, the the problems of the of the of care work, both paid and unpaid, became very visible in those two years. But it hasn't changed at all the means of production of reproductive labor, and I think that's that's that was very striking to notice that it's such a it's such a strong or it, like capital has such a stronghold on this kind of uh, mode of production that there is really no interest in all. Uh, to change this, of course, uh, even even though the visibility is so great. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, it's, it definitely makes the case for it. Um, and as I wanted to ask you, um, so obviously we've been talking a lot about internal struggles and social issues. Um, Stefan, he's he struggles a lot with his personal life and his health issues. Um, has he watched the film at all? And what was his reaction to it, if he has? Yeah, that for me was the best screening ever. Uh, he watched the, the the Virgin even before uh, making the color grading and, and the sound mix set. I finished editing in Germany actually. That was in January last year, and I told him, "Okay, Stephen, we all we almost met each other one year ago." So I finished the film. Would you like to watch it? He said, "Yeah, sure," and he came next day. I made a special screening for him and Oka and, 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 and our channel. And he was the one of the best audience that I see in my life. He was interacting with really with each with each scene. In the beginning and the intro, he was laughing and looking at me. When did you do that? Because this is me, like this kid is so beautiful. And later he told me, like, this is my house, and he was really interacting with everything. And in a special thing with his mother, his mother died from a long time, and she uh, wrote a letter for him. And in this scene, he was really crying a lot. And after that, um, there was a scene where he's playing music again. So he smiled, and when when the finish when the film was finished, like he just looked at me and he cried again. And for me, that was the best feeling ever. Uh, that he like it and that he uh, that he felt it as as I felt it too. That's so lovely to hear because I, yeah. I thought that that part of the film was particularly moving and you could I thought you did a really good job at getting him to open up and you could really see how he felt but it wasn't exploitative it wasn't it wasn't forcing a reaction you could tell that he cared so much about this letter and I thought that was really lovely. Um, I kind of I wanted to ask you um, how like because he's very optimistic as a person, um, and you can see that in the film despite all of these issues. How did you show that in the film? Like, what was your approach? Um, as I told, for the beginning, it was actually a feature film, and it was more about uh, his family and uh, him because he also has problem with his kids because they don't like him to work as a street musician uh, but uh, when I watched the material again and, and I talked with Stefan again I wanted the film to, pull more, to, to be more about him not about uh, his personal uh, issues with his family because also his kids uh, now they are not kids like they are older than me but they didn't uh, be a part of, of the film uh, so I just uh, wanted to make a self uh, portrait uh, about him. Uh, uh, sorry, what, what was the question again? Because I forgot. Um, so it was how you went about that approach. So yeah, you can really see that he's like so passionate and optimistic about life. In, in his life, he's really optimistic, even if he has a lot of, of issues financially with his family, with his job. It's not. Um, uh, suitable or fixed job, he, he must work uh, three or four times weekly. Uh, if he didn't, he would not have enough money to, even to get food. Uh, but he always, uh, he's really optimistic. Like when he got his uh, the house uh, where he's living now, there was no electricity, there was no water, even since I, like, I was there one year ago the last time. Uh, that the, there was no uh, natural water like he used the the rain the the water which comes from the rain to wash his dishes and, and so on 
but right now I, I was really happy because he called me last month and he told me he got enough money and he will have uh, water soon in his house. Uh, he, when he plays music, he just felt that uh, he's living and he's happy and even if he, he will just play this music for himself. So it always uh, kept him going on. Uh, when uh, he when he know or when he get a feedback from one of, of the audience or one of the people who are walking on the street, you are playing lovely music. Uh, we love the music that you are playing. Of course, this gives him an incredible energy and an incredible potential to continue. Yeah, it's, it's definitely very powerful. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask Simon in particular. Obviously, your you talk a little bit about your dad in the film. Um, I wanted to know whether this was like difficult to talk about. How did you find that process? And do you think it changed anything in the film, the aesthetics or anything like that? Um, yeah, I did find it difficult. Um, and I think it came about because we had this shared Google Doc and Leo, you called it a day book or some kind of a notebook that we had with each other. and. At some point, and I think some at some point we decided together which parts are going to be in the film and which aren't. And for me, it's always easier to uh, hide behind uh, theoretical arguments or uh, well-crafted sentences rather than personal accounts. And I think this was a very um, beautiful mode of working together to see that this um, can be made a part of the film and uh, was was encouraged in our work working together. Yeah, definitely. I, I thought that was a really powerful part of it and I, th I think it was it was nice to see that person behind it I guess um, so how did, did you guys meet at film school or did you meet um, both as carers no, we did meet in the in the context of our uh, study program which is critical studies which is not specifically a um, uh, film school so both of us have um, very different practices. Leo, you said, yeah, you, you came from documentary movies, now you're more in, in performance. Um, I'm more, I have, I have a more text-based uh, practice, actually. And we decided, I think, to join forces on this film project because it made sense in this uh, in this specific instance to use, to work with film, uh, uh, to work with this material and also to, to leave it be uh, a film and not to transfer it into a different a different medium. Although you probably, you, for in one instance, you did transform it into a different medium. Yeah, I used uh, that. That's true. I used part um, parts which are now in the film. I used uh, combined with um, with um, other um, parts of the material and also with voiceover for the theater play I made the last year. That leads us on really nicely because um, one of the students from the course, Laura, has asked what you're planning to do next and what your next projects will be so i'd be interested to hear more about that that sounds really good um yeah maybe i start um i, I will do my master thesis or write my master thesis right now and i will do a performance as a master project maybe with with video um but yeah but it's a live uh live thing for the stage and i will do it in november it sounds that sounds really really interesting i'd be excited to see that it sounds really good simon what about you have you got any future projects coming up um i also trying to finish this master that we've been on for uh, a really long time now uh probably with a with a with a written with a written uh half artistic half theoretical um kind of uh thesis on uh domestic realism in a way, or at least at some point uh, touching on and I guess probably continuing the film by thinking about how it's impossible to imagine anything different than the constellations of family uh, that uh, we know in, this, in, in these kinds of uh, societies that we're living in. And one thing that Leah and I are doing together, it's not, it's not very far now, but we're trying to do a podcast with young adults on uh, the necessity of a museum by uh, young people, designed by young people for young people um, in Vienna. We, we worked on this for the past two years now, and now um, the young people we work with uh, were uh, wishing to do a podcast oh, as a museum, sounds, basically. That sounds great. Um, if you send us the details, we can promote that for you, because that sounds absolutely amazing. Um, do you, where can we find that? Is it in 
Is it a work in progress or is it? Yeah, I see. We'll let you know, gladly. Okay, <laughs> lovely. And as what about you? What are you working on next? Uh, right now I'm writing my first uh, feature fiction film. It's about a pregnant woman who was giving birth uh, during the first wave of corona and uh, in the curfew time in a small village where there are no hospitals. Uh, so uh, the film is like um, one of the road films uh, from her village to the city, how she will go there and uh, how she will give up uh, for his for her kids. That sounds very exciting. Yeah. I'm really excited to see that. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask you guys if you have any questions for each other. I don't know whether you've watched the any of the films that are up at the moment, but I'd be interested to see if you have any questions regarding each other's films. I didn't watch uh, the films yet, but I'm planning yet to start watching from Monday. So... Uh, then later we can ask each other. Yeah, I, uh, that's the same for me. I, I start watching the films. Yes, uh, I will do it on the weekend, but I just start today. So I'm, I am very excited to see it. Lovely. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Lydia now. Um, I think there's been a few questions on YouTube. And Hello, everybody. Hello from me again. I was uh, great. Yes, I've been monitoring the uh, the chat here. I'm not sure if there's going to be any more questions. There's one question which we haven't asked yet, which is specifically about uh, Anna's. Uh, and it's a, it goes back to this particular scene uh, uh, where, you, uh, where your character, Stefan, uh, is looking at the photos of his uh, mother. And the question is, how was the process of editing the film with the stills of him and his mother? How was that particularly as an as editing process? That, that's the question. Uh, during uh, shooting the film, I asked him if he has uh, old photos uh, for him or his family and any archive videos where he was playing videos. Then he told me, yeah, and I watched it. Uh, I, I saw all of, all of his photos. It was more than uh, 600 photos. Uh, then uh, one day he told me, uh, did I tell you about uh, my mother? I told him, not yet. He told me she wrote a letter for, for all of us. I told him, okay, I would like uh, to see it. And uh, we met uh, without filming and he started uh, to read uh, this uh, letter and he was so emotional. He just read the first sentence. I told him, okay, please stop. We will meet again. Uh, because I, do, I don't want uh, to listen from you now, uh, because if he repeated again, it would not be good. Uh, so we met on the next day, he came to the channel and I started filming with him and I was, I talked with him and he read the full letter. It was actually, uh, it took more than 10 minutes uh, and uh, it was so emotional then. Uh, we put it, and they got the idea to combine it with uh, with his uh, with those photos. I thought that it would be better than showing him uh, just showing him reading the letter. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yes, that, that's great. Um, yeah, I, in terms of questions from the audience, uh, I don't actually have any more. I don't know if anybody else wants to sneak in uh, one last minute, but I think. Kate and speakers, you've done a great job. I don't think there's any really massive questions sticking up unless you want to add something that we haven't actually asked you and you want to kind of make a point. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we will thank you. But yeah, is there anything you want to add that you haven't had a chance to say yet? What that came up? No? Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Kate, for hosting it, for you coming and for coming and to our audience, both in the Zoom and on YouTube, and hopefully the ones who will see us later, because we hope to, well, we plan to actually uh, eventually upload this as a recorded uh, event. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. Good luck, and uh, please watch the films. Uh, everybody, please vote for Audience Award as well. Don't forget we have an Audience Award, and that is important. So, go watching, go enjoying. <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot for having us. <laughs> and thanks for the invitation. Yeah. Good luck with everything. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you really Thank much. Thank you. Bye.